master's in American studies, also at Columbia University, and his BA in American literature at UPenn. He's been named a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. He has many other accomplishments. He's the editor of Civil War History. He's awarded the Sheila Biddle Ford Foundation Fellowship at the Hutchinson Center for African Amer and American History at Harvard University in 2022 to 2023. And in 2022, he received an NEH grant to direct a summer institute, Civil War Archives, a new social and culture history for faculty in higher education. Moreover, he's published articles and essays in The Atlantic, in The New Yorker, Slate, Vice, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and the LA Review of Books, among others. We're so lucky to have Dr. Downs here with us today at this month's INCHIP event. So before I hand it over, I just wanted to remind you that we will be holding questions till the end of the talk, but there will be a Q&A at the end where you can raise your hands and unmute yourselves to ask a question, um, or you can put your question in the chat. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Downs. Great. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I apologize for the change of format. I'm thrilled to be able to present my research to this illustrious group. And I'm going to start right away by giving you just the general overview of what my book is, um, Maladies of Empire. And it's the only slide that I'm going to read directly just so that I'm absolutely clear that you have the argument of the book and what I'm trying to contribute both to the history of medicine and science, global health, and also the histories of slavery, um, emancipation, and gender and sexuality. So um, basically what I argue is that these three major tra uh, social transformations, colonialism, um, slavery, and war, all happened between the mid 18th century and the early part of the 19th century. That social transformation gives birth to the field of epidemiology. And in essence, what I'm examining are the ways in which slavery, colonialism, and war created built environments, slave ships, plantations, battlefields, and other spaces that enabled physicians to visualize the spread of infectious disease. This led to an unprecedented proliferation of case studies that provided the foundation for epidemiology. I chart this development with the beginning of the field of chemistry in the mid 1750s and studies of air and ventilation to the creation of the first international sanitary commissions that studied the spread of epidemics in the mid 19th century. My research reveals how doctors moved away from thinking of supernatural forces or miasma theory as the cause of disease and began to investigate the spread of epidemics, which led to the field of epidemiology. So um, I'm going to start by just giving you a quick overview of my own research, because this is um, a, a forum on um, health. I th thought I would talk just a second about my first book, and that will be the first slide. Um, and it's basically, we could just move to, let's see if I can do, excellent, thank you. Uh, my first book, um, Sick from Freedom, um, provided the foundation for my study of epidemiology. Um, in large part, um, we know that the Civil War led to massive um, mor morbidity and mortality rates. More soldiers died from infectious disease than they died from battle. This is in large part due to the fact that the Civil War happened in the 1860s before the advent of bacteriology and germ theory, so that many doctors postulated incorrect theories about how disease was spreading, and they didn't know how to develop the protocols uh, to prevent the spread of disease. Um, this is a known fact um, within the history of the Civil War, but it's a point that often gets obscured because the traditional history of the war tends to focus on logistics and military campaigns and battles, and it often obscures the medical realities. That has um, a real, that's had a real detrimental effect on how we understand emancipation so that when Bond's people began to liberate themselves from slavery as early as 1862 in very large numbers. They entered into a war environment that was devastated by infectious disease. 
we have told the story of emancipation and for good reason as a triumphant story because it leads to the passing of three major amendments that grant birthright citizenship, abolish slavery, and give black men the right to vote. But this period also unleashed a major medical disaster that left countless uh, freed people suffering and dying. In Sick From Freedom, I pieced together federal records to reconstruct a smallpox epidemic that began in 1862 and lasted until um, roughly 1870. When I was looking at the federal response for the smallpox epidemic, the government said things like they didn't have the manpower resources to respond to the epidemic. And that it, on one level made sense to me largely because the Civil War lasted longer than anyone in government thought. And also there were such morbidity and mortality rates among soldiers that of course, the added burden of freed people would be a problem for the federal government. They also blamed the spread of smallpox and other infectious disease on black people's innate um, physiology. And they argued that black people were inferior to white people. So there, were def there was definitely a kind of racist ideology that underpin how they rationalized the spread of disease. What shocked me as I was continuing the research was that by 1866, a year after the war ended, um, a cholera pandemic began and it originated in India It moved into Russia, into Europe, it crossed over the Atlantic Ocean into Canada, New York, and then it blanketed the South and West. The government that had said for so long that they were beleaguered, that they didn't have the manpower, they didn't understand the spread of infectious disease, all of a sudden developed an efficacious protocol to prevent the spread of cholera, which in the 19th century was a relatively unknown malady, as opposed to smallpox, which had been around for centuries. And so I wanted to know how was it possible that the federal government could work to create protocols to stop cholera from spreading, but allowed smallpox to spread. So I concluded Sick From Freedom by saying, well, this was in large part due to the fact that there was medical racism. Smallpox affected black people, whereas cholera affected white people. And so the government developed a plan to stop the cholera pandemic because it infected white residents in a way in which the smallpox epidemic only affected black residents. So I'm just going to go to the next slide really quickly. Um, and there are all re these reasons why they kind of made claims about black people's health, um, everything from dislocation of the, the, that emancipation smart, sparked to the Southern landscape was inherently diseased to unclear ideas about germ theory. Um, but when it came to cholera, they were able to develop um, an effective protocol. So when I concluded that book, I wanted to know how were doctors able to develop what was in many respects um, epidemiological methods to prevent the spread of infectious disease. And so I began research in the British archives to study the sort of origin of the of 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 epidemiology as a field. So can we go to the next the next slide? Um, in the 19th century, the definitions of epidemiology um, basically oscillated between two major claims: the study of how disease spreads across a population, and then how to control and prevent um, epidemics from spreading. Uh, next slide. And so. Um, one of the major epidemics that happens in, the, in in London in the 19th century is the outbreak of cholera. This causes major alarm in the city. Physicians are sort of overwhelmed with the number of people becoming sick, and they don't understand how it's actually spreading among um, the population. Um, next slide. Um, John Snow, um, not to be confused with John Snow of Game of Thrones fame, um, was a British um, anesthesiologist. He performed anesthesia on Queen Victoria. He basically becomes recognized as sort of solving the cholera crisis. Snow leaves um, his practice and goes into a poor section in London, into the Soho, Soho section, and he starts to knock on people's doors. He knocks on one family store and he finds out everyone in that particular home is infected with cholera and they're sick. 
And then he goes to the next door and only one person is sick. Then he goes to the next door and no one's sick. Then he goes to the next house and everyone's sick. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense for Snow because at this particular time, um, doctors understand contagion theory. So they understand if one person becomes sick that other people can get sick as a result of it being contagious. Well, if it's contagious, why is it skipping over certain households? And why is it only infecting certain people within the household? So Snow then begins to develop some methods to um, understand the spread of, of disease. And what he does is he starts collecting um, the numbers of people that are infected. He wants to sort of turn to statistics as some type of metric to use to rationalize the spread of the epidemic. If I can count how many people are sick, if I can count how many people who died, if I can count even how many people who recovered, that statistical number will provide some insight into figuring out this problem. He then performs post-mortem evaluations on the body. And at the time, people didn't just believe in contagion, they believed in something called miasma theory. And miasma theory was that if you had trash or rotten vegetables or corpse of animals or humans, what it would do is it would emanate a certain smell, a poisonous vapor that would infect the air. And then you would breathe in that poisonous vapor and then become sick. So there was already, you can see in that in this description, a kind of atmospheric understanding of how disease spread, but also an understanding that an invisible agent or some kind of thing that we can't um, empirically identify is causing the outbreak of disease. And so when Snow performs uh, postmortem evaluations on the bodies, he noticed that there are no problems in the, the, the people's lungs, that their lungs are not damaged in any way. If in fact they were breathing in poisonous vapors, there would be traces of that in the lungs. Instead, he notices that the GI tract has been compromised. So to make a very long story short, um, based on his investigative methods, he then postulates, he theorizes that this that cholera is a result of the fact of the water that people are drinking. And he theorizes that the, that the reason why it's spreading is that certain people are drinking from the water and certain people are not. And so this is what sort of what's turned him into the sort of father of epidemiology. This is what has sort of um, elevated him to sort of um, to the sort of canon of important thinkers. And my talk here today is not in any way to depose him of these titles or to um, in some way um, discredit his theories, which later um, germ theorists um, would prove his theory was right, that the cholera was active in the water and transmitting um, that, that way. What I'm trying to sort of say in my own work is to place Snow in a particular context. Next slide. John Snow gets portrayed as the lonely pioneer who ventures into a poor section of London to uncover the spread of cholera. What often gets left out of the story is that he's part of a larger cohort of physicians known as the London Epidemiological Society. And these are doctors who throughout the 1840s are deployed throughout the British Empire to India, to Jamaica, to parts of Africa to study the spread of infectious disease. Once they are in these various environments, they develop methods to understand how disease is spreading and they develop methods to help prevent and control the spread of disease. When they return to the metropole, they believe that their experience abroad in these various environments provided them with an important expertise. And that expertise leads them to developing the first ever epidemiological society in 1850. So that John Snow's work is part of a larger cohort of physicians who are investigating the spread of disease throughout the empire. Now, at this point in the talk, you might just say, okay, Downs, what's your point? That we are, this is a sort of lateral move. It's not just Snow, it's Snow and 20 or 30 other physicians. My point is to probe the work of these various doctors throughout the British Empire who produced case studies 
that then led to the development of epidemiology. But it's also to place these case studies within a better historical context and to examine the ways in which this production of knowledge resulted from the violence of both colonialism and slavery. That these doctors were able to create preventive protocols and understand the spread of disease because their role as imperial physicians gave them a bird's eye view to study disease in a completely unprecedented way. And that the proliferation of these various reports helped to frame and helped to create the development of epidemiology as a field. So next slide. Three years before um, John Snow theorizes about the spread of cholera, a physician named uh, Gavin Milroy is sent to Jamaica in 1850 to study the spread of cholera throughout J Jamaica. What's fascinating is that when cholera would, would break out for British physicians in places like Soho and other parts of the country, they would be overwhelmed by the chaos of the epidemic. They weren't able to distance themselves and to theorize about the disease. They instead were responding to the outbreak and treating patients. Colonialism at the, at the, on the very bare minimum provided them with an aerial view. It gave them a map of a particular location. It allowed them to start tracking the spread of disease. More importantly, the bureaucracy of colonialism allowed someone like Gavin Milroy to be in Kingston, but then to request, request reports from medical and military officials throughout the entire country and to get those officials to then report back morbidity and mortality rates and methods of prevention and control of the epidemic. What's happening here is that colonialism is systematizing the production of knowledge and it's facilitating the creation of medical theories. This is also happening at a time when the rise of medical professional societies was somewhat limited. This sort of structure of colonialism creates a systematic way of capturing this information, but it also creates a bird's eye view so that someone like Milroy can be positioned in a small corridor of the country, but ultimately see how the disease was spreading throughout Jamaica. Next slide. Not only does um, Milroy talk about the spread of epidemic uh, cholera, as he calls it in his treatise back to um, government officials in the metropole, but he's also then able to create a map that places Jamaica within the broader context of the Atlantic Basin, which includes other parts of the Caribbean and the southern part of the United States. So right now, colonialism is creating mapping technologies that's helping physicians like Milroy trace the spread of cholera beyond their own local area and beginning and allow them to see it over a broader geography. Okay, so um, next slide. I'm gonna give you um, another sort of example besides the sort of mapping technology that colonialism creates that helps produce the hallmark of epidemiology. I wanna give you now a sort of case study. And this brings us to Cape Verde, which is on the um, west coast of Africa, the islands that sort of are um, pictured here um, in the illustration, I hope you can see. Um, in 1846, a British vessel is deployed to Sierra Leone to police uh, the west coast of Africa for any sign of the illegal slave trade. Um, this particular expedition um, attracts the attention of a lot of poor white men who sign up to be part of this endeavor, hoping that they are going to receive a huge reward if they can, in fact, capture people who are involved in the traffic, illegal traffic of, of enslaved Africans at this time. Um, this is at a point in history when the British uh, Parliament has ab abolished uh, transatlantic slave trade, but there's still rumors and actual later historians will prove, provide evidence of the trafficking, the illegal trafficking of, of enslaved people. So 
the what happens is the um, ship known as the Eclair cruises up and down the sort of west coast of Africa for any signs of the illegal uh, transport of enslaved Africans, and it finds none. So the men are sort of frustrated. They're not going to get a huge reward. They have to sail back to um, England. On their way back, they stop at Cape Verde. Um, Cape Verde at that particular time is under Portuguese control. As soon as they get off the ship, it's very customary that washerwomen, local women in town, mostly in this particular case, they were women of color. Um, they're often, well, for, based on the surviving records, they're biracial women. Um, they board the ships, they clean the various linens. The men go out for two or three days, they party, they have a great time on the island. According to even recent records, there are two or three of the men that are still missing, they never came back. And so what happens is um, when they aboard the ship, some of them start becoming ill. When the ship arrives um, to the British Harbor, um, they are now sick. Many of them are now sick and can't, determine if they're sick because they themselves like picked up some illness in a part of Africa and that's what's causing them to be ill or if, or because they have all of these ideas that Africa as a continent is a diseased place. They don't know if it's something they ate. They can't figure it out. Um, but what it does is it triggers a major debate in London in, the, in 1846 around quarantine. Um, when I first began writing about this book and I had submitted it to my editor, I had quarantine in the title. My editor was like, you really need to like spell that out. People really don't know what that is. And then I went through the proofs of the, the book um, during the pandemic and the whole debate over the health of the economy versus the health of the of people were came into sharp focus as a result of so people now i think are in a much clearer understanding of the kind of debates that we were seeing happening um in um 2021 and so forth in 2020 um happened in the 1840s that is to say merchants in london argue that that the ship should be quarantined, that people that the men should not be allowed off because if it's if their trading partners in France and Spain find out that the British knew that the ship was in fact infected, then no one's going to want to trade with them if they didn't follow the quarantine uh, policies. Others said if our trading partners find out that we have cholera or or yellow fever, they didn't know what disease was on the ship. No one's going to want to trade with us either way. So it created a huge debate, very similar to what we saw um, with COVID. Um, ultimately, the British government decides to um, send a, a surgeon to um, Cape Verde to investigate the spread of yellow fever and to determine if in fact it originated in that particular location. Um, this guy's name is John McWilliam. When John McWilliam arrives in um, Cape Verde, he sets up an office um, with the Portuguese in which he begins this major process of interviewing the washerwomen, the local residents, and anyone who collect who knew anything about this um, epidemic. Now I'm going to go to the next slide. And I'm just going to pause for a second and sort of talk a little bit about how I found this document. And then I'm going to get back to the document. So when I began this research in the British um, archives, I would I was looking mostly at the military records at Kew in London. Um, but then I also went to the Wellcome Institute. And at the time, I was living in New York, and I took a red eye. Um, I arrived in London. I immediately showered, ran to the welcome. And if you know anything about historical research, it requires going into the rare book room and filling out various requests for documents you want to look at and then waiting. So I had like a period of two or three hours waiting for the documents that I requested. So I was sort of jet lagged and exhausted and I wanted like a latte. There's like a pretty good cafe there. They have some decent chocolate cake, maybe a chicken sandwich. I don't know, like I was gonna like eat something, but something told me to 
walk around the stacks and they have all of these open stacks that are available for readers for secondary purposes. And it's the size of like any major library. And I went to a shelf and it was sort of, it was incredibly fortuitous. I pulled a book off the shelf and it was a collection of five um, primary source pamphlets. And I opened it up and I saw this page that you're seeing on your screen right now. And what it said was, and I'll try to read it to you, um, it start naming various women and marking their race using the 19th century nomenclature as mulatto. And then it included a verbatim um, transcription of their encounter with this epidemic, um, the yellow fever epidemic in Cape Verde. And as a historian, I have been studying the intersection of race and medicine for at that, at that point for about 15 years. Most of the research that I did for Sick from Freedom and my first book was piecing together fragments of government records, military records, newspaper reports, pension records, to try to get a sense of what did an epidemic mean for Black people. There was never, and I still haven't found it 20 some years later, a document in which a physician interviewed various people, especially various people of color. And in, so, so in this case in Cape Verde, it was enslaved people and colonized people of color and took note of how they understood the epidemic. Everything from the incubation period, the major hallmark of yellow fever, which is black vomit, to where the epidemic spread from the eclair to the military post to other parts of the village to who died. Now, these washerwomen and enslaved people and colonized people had no understanding that a British official would come to their home three months later after an epidemic blew up and ask them detailed questions about the spread of disease and how they ultimately controlled it. But they had that information and this particular doctor recognized the value of it. I'm just gonna to go to the next slide. Um, I don't know if we can see it, but here the next slide is, it's actually the testimony of an enslaved woman who talks about the spread of the virus, where it went in a particular island and who she knew that actually contracted it and who actually um, died as a result of it. This was a sort of mind blowing document because it provided copious evidence of how enslaved and colonized people rationalize the spread of, 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 of epidemics and more importantly, develop methods to help control and prevent it. Um, the doctor, um, McWilliam, eventually returns to London. He shows this information to the powers that be. The debate continues about quarantine and the British actually don't believe him. Now we can have all kinds of speculations as to why. What I'm interested more is the fact that this particular doctor, John McWilliam, is a member of the Epidemiological Society. He is developing methods on the spread of infectious disease based on the testimony of enslaved and colonized people. Those testimonies help to create an understanding of epidemics and an understanding of, of the methods of epidemiologists that then provides the context for Jon Snow. So when we think about Jon Snow, and he's often heralded as the father of epidemiology, we often sort of just tell this singular story about him among the poor in London, not realizing that Jon Snow was walking in the footsteps of colonial doctors. Jon Snow had learned about the spread of infectious disease and the various methods of interviewing people from McWilliam and and by extension from these various washerwomen and other people um, in the in, in Cape Verde. Okay, so the next piece of this is, it's about what I wanna comment really quickly here on is sort of my own methodological orientation and my own way of reading the sources. When I looked at this particular document, the appearance of these women was revelatory. 
but I didn't have any other information about them, census data, other document, other documents to substantiate their claims. Even the most generous and sympathetic social historians would invariably marginalize these women to the footnotes because they don't leave much of an archival trace. I, however, am doing an analysis that's drawing on interdisciplinary methods, and my undergraduate training was in English. And so what I began to sort of think about was how can we use literary studies that has been very much invested in the question of recovering the subjectivity of women and of Black people in Western canonical literature, in Shakespeare and Faulkner, and in all of these major texts, how can we use those same reading practices and apply it to medical history? Next slide. And so my, um, next slide, thank you. Next slide, there we go, one more, sorry, there we go. My way of thinking about uncovering the subjectivity of these women and placing them um, in large part um, as the center of the subject results from the influence of Toni Morrison's reading Playing in the Dark, in which he really conceptualizes what is the presence of Black people within canonical literature. The Kumbahi River Collective, which invents the language of intersectionality and thinking about how we can actually talk about um, people who occupy various marginal spaces. Hazel Carby's Reconstructing Womenhood, rethinking the notion of what is a particular text. And then Sadia Hartman's um, Venus in Two Acts, which um, postulates the idea of critical fabulation, which I don't critically fabulate in this, but I take the sort of um, license of sort of flipping the script here and placing these women as the protagonists within the story. Now, this is really important because I uncovered this evidence in around 2014 or so, 15, and then I worked on other parts of the book I then learned a major historian, not to mention any names, Mark Harrison, um, a leading historian at Oxford, um, was very fascinated with the quarantine debate as well. And he wrote a whole chapter about this quarantine debate and the Cape Verde case. And I thought, oh no, someone is working on my research. They're doing the same exact topic. Uh, and I opened up his book and his entire chapter on Cape Verde and on the Eclair and the quarantine debate was all told from the vantage point of the medical authorities as the leading protagonist. And there was not one reference to the washerwomen. And so what I think as a historian is that we need both histories. We need the history that does it, that tells it, that narrates it from the vantage point of the doctors as the leading protagonist. But we also need the history that actually centers the washerwomen, because they are principal actors in the creation of knowledge that help to um, lead to the development of epidemiology as a field. So the field of epidemiology um, sort of is created in sort of in, in, in 1850. As a historian, I said, okay, well, that's when they set up shop where can we start to sort of see the origin of this particular thinking? So I went into the 1840s and I saw evidence of epidemiological thinking in colonial plantations and um, in Jamaica and other parts of the British Atlantic world, and then in parts of India. I went back to the 1820s and 1830s and I saw British expeditions in Egypt and part of another parts of um, Africa as part of a, a another sort of part of thinking about how disease was spreading. I kept going back in time until I reached 1750. And 1750 um, is the sort of rise of chemistry as a field of study. Um, prior to 1750, um, chemistry was um, a sort of, um, just the sort of the, the work the work of alchemists and it was the, the work of court jesters. It did it didn't have the sort of bona fides as a as a critical field of study. But what you begin to sort of see in 1750 is the formalized study of um, elements, particularly surrounding oxygen and air, 
which become key components within the early fields of epidemiology. So I'm just gonna skip to a couple of slides, not this, this is a slide really quickly. The next slide here is just the mapping. We can see here, this is just the map that snow created on the right and then the map that comes out of Cape Verde, but we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so just another quick story about um, how chemistry, how air works and how people were thinking about it. So of course, since Aristotle, um, thinker, scientist, human beings, everyone recognized the value of air to breathe. But the idea of studying how does air change its quality based on certain circumstances becomes the subject of chemistry in the 1750s. And it's sort of part of laboratory studies and debates among scientists um, like Lavoisier in France, Boyle, people in Germany and England, and they're all using various instruments and in laboratories known as, as troughs to basically capture air and to say air is doing something, it's changing its quality when I use this particular device. Well, that was a scientific explanation that provided the existence of oxygen as a sort of as a as a sort of element. But then the question was what's happening on the ground and what did it mean for actual people? So there's a legendary story, and it's I'm not here to um, vouch for its veracity. The notes of my book sort of suggest that it's a problematic story in lots of ways, but it becomes a key touchstone story in how people begin to understand that air changes its quality when you change the physical condition. So a number of British prisoners of war were um, placed in a, a, a very small jail cell um, in India. While they were in there, they begged the guard for um, water because there was just a small window in the jail cell and they were getting sick and some of them were passing out. And so ultimately the guard feels bad for them and takes their hat, fills it with water, passes it through the window. They then give it to their highest ranking military official who drinks the water, but does not feel relieved in any way. So he later recounts that he thought he was going to die even after drinking the water. For whatever reason, he is moved to the front of the jail cell right underneath. You can see the window here in these illustrations. It's when he gets fresh air that he begins to feel relieved. So this case study um, becomes very well known by lots of medical thinkers throughout the 18th and 19th century. It's in the Lancet. It's in lots of places that ventilation is necessary for human survival and that oxygen does change um, its quality once you're in a crowded environment. Now, for you and me and lots of other people, you would be saying, well, that seems obvious. But in the 18th century, this is before the rise of tenements, um, we have to think about what were the places where people would observe um, crowded conditions causing air to change its quality. And mostly they were prisons and hospitals, which were then the shelters for the dispossessed. So as a result of these two places, many people didn't care. So even though reformers and other people were saying, you know, something's happening in these congested prisons, most people didn't care about those populations. So studies of air sort of were pushed aside. Okay, next slide. Um, what we didn't, next slide, oh, sorry. What we do see, however, is that the rise of chemistry and its companion study of oxygen which gains momentum in 1750 and is often placed on one timeline is divorced from the social history timeline, which is that in 1750, it's the height of the transatlantic slave trade. So that my work is basically saying, let's take this work on the history of chemistry and understandings of air and how it affects humans to this larger global transformation so that the studies of oxygen that we know of today and that we can understand how did the scientific community become persuaded that air changes quality and crowded conditions, well, they turn to the transatlantic slave trade. And the example on the um, PowerPoint here is of the Brook slave ship. And this is a ship that has become sort of iconic within abolitionist literature. And again, it's something that many people 
Today, various historians doubt and question the representation of the enslaved Africans in this ship, but it nevertheless was used throughout the 18th and 19th century to prove that when you place um, many enslaved Africans at the bottom of the ship without proper ventilation, it leads to high rates of morbidity and mortality. Again, this sounds like a very intuitive idea that most people would have, but it took the empirical evidence of these people becoming sick and dying for medical officials and government officials to actually produce new designs of ships that um, create a ventilation. This particular illustration is the result of a testimony by the name of, Dom, of, of the name of a guy by the name of Thomas Trotter. Trotter goes to the bottom of the ships. He notices that um, enslaved Africans' bodies are sort of um, smashed up against each other. They're spoon. They're sort of um, without um, any air. He then says that they're not allowed to go on top of the decks to dance, to walk, to get fresh air, and as a result, they're becoming sick. So when I read this, it became in a really important illustration of how the suffering uh, conditions of enslaved Africans began to provide um, concrete evidence of how air was changing its quality at the bottom of the ships. And this was an important element in the early drafts of the book, but it was only one example. And I thought, well, I want to make the claim that this transatlantic slave trade helped to validate oxygen as a common element within the periodic table, but this was only one example until I did further research. Next slide. What I began to realize is that Stephen Hales, known as a major chemist, a clergyman, he began to create ventilators to help promote the circulation of air. He then um, calls for the introduction of ventilators on various slave ships. Next slide. While he's on while what he eventually proves is that once you have a mechanically run uh, ventilator on these ships, it pr promotes circulation. And as a result, it lowers morbidity and mortality rates. What blew me away was that in a scientific document designed to promote the efficacy of ventilators, Stephen Hale quotes from enslaved Africans and from the captains of these various ships as evidence that these mechanical um, ventilators do produce fresh air. He says, in order, um, I was informed that, uh, that a Liverpool ship, which had ventilators, not one of the 800 slaves died. Um, he then says, in other places, without ventilators, 30, 40, 50, or 60 died. So now we see that the transatlantic slave trade is being used to provide empirical evidence that not only solidifies the notion of oxygen, but also helps to lead to the technological creation of ventilators that's going to produce better health. So um, I'm going to sort of just in 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 the um, in an effort to sort of state to, to have some questions. Um, I'm going to sort of end it there. But what I want to be able to sort of say just in a nutshell is that what we see is that slavery and colonialism both create brand new sort of built environments that provide um, opportunities for doctors to begin to spread the infectious, to, to, to begin to investigate the spread of infectious disease. Th these doctors on these various ships then use this sort of bureaucracy of colonialism, all of the reports that they have to write, they use that as the first draft to begin theorizing about prevention protocols, about how to stop um, the, the spread of disease and what they think is causing it. Those reports generated by the colonial and military bureaucracy become the first drafts of early epidemiology, but most of these physicians by the 
early part of the 19th century recognize that what they've learned on these on these ships and in these plantations and in these various places has given them a type of expertise that then leads to the creation of epidemiology. But the story of epidemiology's origin is not just about these doctors. It's about how did the conditions of slavery and colonialism help to inform these developments and how did the violence of these social transformations lead to new understandings of medicine? And more importantly, how did the subjugated populations on these ships and in these places help to inform knowledge production about epidemics and methods to control the spread of disease. Thank you. And then the last slide has my info on it, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Downs. I um, have my hand raised and I meant to just have a um, applause. Um, so um, anyone who has a question at this time, you can either take yourself off of mute and ask it, um, or you can put it in the chat and I can read it out loud. While we're waiting, I can um, sure. I can ask a question. Um, this was a, a really interesting talk. I'm um, I'm a social epidemiologist, um, and so I have just a little bit of, of context um, for some of the things you were talking about. And um, your focus was really on the, um, the the context for colonialism related to um, infectious disease and the science of infectious disease. Um, I'm kind of curious how this translates to um, the understanding of um, sort of um, social causes of diseases and basically whether or not colonialism in itself promoted an understanding or reflection about um, fundamental cause theory um, or, you know, kind of poverty as as a um, as a cause of disease. So you're kind of saying that there was a little bit of um, of you know, there was a little bit of reflection and, and acknowledgement of, of sort of the importance of new methods to sort of understand infectious right. disease um, that 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 was sort of facilitated by um, colonialism. Uh, did that, how did this sort of, how does this relate to then sort of social causes of diseases? <laughs> yeah, it, they don't, it's interesting. I feel like that's much more of a kind of like modern contemporary way of thinking about it. I mean, I think that that they, they don't see their own role in transmitting disease. And so I think that like a project that I've been kind of toying with is, is to do just that is like, how can I, as a historian, make the argument that, you know, the very introduction of colonialism <laughs> produced the spread of disease and how, I mean, people have done that within the early Atlantic world and the question of how did the sort of arrival of Europeans lead to massive mortality among indigenous people. So that's, that's part of it. Um, but yeah, that's not, it, it's not really part of their, it's not really part of their mindset. They don't, um, I haven't seen any evidence of that, even though it's clear that, you know, in the case of Cape Verde, for example, like they're probably the reason why Cape Verde became infected with yellow fever because so much of the studies um, around this were the, of all the testimonies were that was that the yellow fever didn't exist there. I mean, it, it may have been there in the 1810s or earlier, but it, but all of the testimonies pinpoint that it's the arrival of the ship when all of a sudden they start seeing yellow fever. Um, and in that case, you know, what could it have been? I mean, they may have picked up mosquitoes in another part of, you know, Africa and they may have been on the boat and that could have, you know, led to it. So I don't, I don't really know like actually how in that particular case it, it worked out, but, um, e but even the notion of cholera, like cholera as a disease begins to sort of spread once you have the expansion of navigation and, and you know, other things that lead to more trade with India, et cetera. Great, thank you. And I see we have some questions coming through in the chat. Um, there's a question from Stacy Jennings. What sparked your interest in epidemiology to begin with? Yeah, so I guess, I, I mean, I, as a historian, um, 
stumbled upon records about illness when I was at the MA level. Um, and I realized that within the Civil War and even within studies, of, especially with studies of emancipation, it was basically, there was nothing really on it. I mean, an article here, an article there. And it was reading um, the records of a woman by the name of Harriet Jacobs who had escaped from slavery and then during the Civil War was working for Northern organizations. And she was commenting on um, the high rates of morbidity and mortality. And that's what um, actually um, led me to do this. To start Thank you. Disease. Yeah, and then what, what you said in the beginning was that um, my PhD is in history, but I was very, very fortunate to uh, get something called the Mellon New Direction Fellowship, which allowed me after tenure to go back to school. Um, and that's when I went to um, Harvard and I studied global health and medical anthropology and epidemiology more formally. Great. Uh, we have another question um, from Matthew Vaughn. Dr. Downs, thank you for your talk. You say that colonialism and slavery changed the social environment, creating the bureaucratic structure that gives rise to new fields and methods of thought. Do you see other social changes since then, or do you feel we're in an extension of the same environment? Um, I see, I see that happening really, um, and I don't, I'll try to be brief with this. I saw that really happening around monkeypox, that what we saw was a subjugated population of people, mostly, um, you know, men who have sex with men and their um, understandings and recognition of, um, of illness and symptoms and transmission helped to then inform how we understood the spread of monkeypox. I saw it in large part with COVID to a, 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 a certain extent. It was patient reporting, talking about things like losing the sense of taste and smell that helped to um, inform the development of a new, of, of an expanded pathology of, um, of COVID. So I, I see s certain things at work. I, have, I was giving this lecture um, last year in the UK and I had a British, a British military physician who said that studies still develop this way um, based on, you know, the colonial, you know, continual presence of British military in other parts of the world are still using this as a way of gathering knowledge and developing new ideas. Thank you. We have another question. Um, from Davis Smith, I'd like to ask a question about the role of naval medicine on early epidemiology, particularly characterization and treatment of scurvy. Yeah, so that's yeah. So I have a whole I have a whole thing on scurvy um, in this presentation and in general that I do, and it's in the book, um, and it also um, relates to, is to the slave trade. So the first thing is. Um, you know, medical knowledge at this time, it's not uniform and it's not systematized. People aren't taking the MCAT, they're not taking licensing tests. So um, various doctors have theorized about what's the best way to cure scurvy. And it was by word of mouth and some studies that would talk about it. Um, but by and large, it was trial and error, lots of doctors figuring it out on their own. And so Thomas Trotter actually, um, in this particular case, um, when the Brooks ship arrives to Antigua, uh, a lot of the enslaved Africans are suffering from scurvy and he recognizes it. He knows that James Lynn's theory is everything from quote, animal meat to wine can cure them, but it's not working. And this is a fascinating moment, which is, um, I don't know if the woman's enslaved or if she's free, but she's definitely a black woman. She walks onto the ship and she sells citrus fruit. And so then he begins this huge experiment about giving them limes and guavas and grapefruit. And he notes that it's not just consuming the fruit, but it's actually sucking the juices directly from the citrus fruit that leads to an almost immediate recovery um, with scurvy. And so what happens is uh, he goes back to his um, mentor in Edinburgh and reports this to him and his mentor says, well, I'm going to stick with what I know and ignore it, but Trotter's intrepid and he publishes an article about it and he then gets to get it republished in Germany and then in Philadelphia. 
Um, but what's fascinating is he uses, and I, I guess if I, it's on one of the slides, he uses the expression, I've learned about this based on a multitude of cases. So the multitude of cases were, were actually enslaved Africans. And so it's interesting, the slippage of language there that he begins to sort of say that it's enslaved Africans that are helping him with that. Now, there's also many naval expeditions where royal surgeons are figuring out the best way to cure scurvy. Some of that they published, some of that that was just um, local knowledge. Thank you. And then we have a last set of questions here. Can you discuss how de dehumanization of Africans led to continuing mistreatment of Blacks in healthcare settings? Henrietta Lacks, forced sterilization and current disparities in health, and how the very colonial structures that enabled this are in a different form still perpetuated today. Right. I mean, the answer, the short answer is that it's about power. And it's about the fact that various um, people who have power are able to subjugate those who don't have power in order to gain medical knowledge. And in, in, in medical history, um, I'm focusing on enslavement, but, you know, Deirdre Cooper Owens, who's at uh, UConn, focuses on enslavement, but then she also focuses on Irish women um, in New York um, in the early part of the 19th century, who there had the least amount of power and were there uh, the most susceptible to uh, medical experimentation. So these kinds of issues um, continually develop as a result of who has power and who doesn't. I mean, that might be a simplistic answer, but that's part of it. Um, and I think I will say, I think that the George Floyd summer changed medical schools. I mean, Black Lives Matter has an origin that predates the summer of 2020. Um, but I think that the summer of 2020 really woke people up, um, pun unintended, um, to the idea of the longstanding sort of medical discrimination within practice, but also just within case studies, within various treatments. So I, I see lots of medical schools now are, are trying to reckon with that. And so I, I'm, I'm actually hopeful um, about this. I don't necessarily think it has to be that way. There's a kind of an awareness that I've, I've noticed shift just from the publication of my first book to this one. And um, there, I, I, I wanna see, it would be great to see more of that, more courses de designed for doctors to understand both how to deal with different populations other than themselves, to deal with subjugated populations, marginalized populations, and then to also reckon with the sort of, the history of the practice and the history of various institutions. Thank you so much. We so appreciated you coming today um, and um, giving us your time. And um, if you would like to um, uh, to follow up with Dr. Downs, I'm sure that he'd be um, happy to to right. hear more questions and comments. Right. right. My, the last slide has my email, but you can find me by just googling me on the Gettysburg website. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you.